Hi, this is Lisa. Welcome or welcome back to Hit the Road with Lisa. The village of Zor has a Civil War reenactment every other year. This year's reenactment had hundreds of reenactors, two battles, artillery night and day fire, settlers and shops, food, music, museums, a Saturday night ball, and the Anvil Tavern. Zor was founded by German religious dissenters called the Society of Separatists of Zor in 1817. It was named after the biblical village to which Lot and his family escaped from Sodom. It was a communal society. All property was communally owned and the farms, shops, and factories were managed by regularly elected trustees. This is on the Ohio historical marker out front. The Zor Meeting House was designed by their leader, Joseph Bimler. The Meeting House is the second house of worship used by the Society of Separatists of Zor. Men and women entered through separate front doors. Men used the right door, women the left. Bimler and his successors gave discourses, not sermons, from a table located between the doors. The Meeting House has been in continuous use since it was built in 1853 and as of 2011 houses the Zor United Church of Christ. The Zor Separatists were so called because they left the established Lutheran Church in their native southeastern Germany. As Pietists, their faith was based on the Bible and centered on a mystical and direct relationship with God. They also believed in Christ's imminent return to earth and in individual spiritual rebirth, the Widerberg. Worship services included the singing of hymns accompanied by musical instruments and, after 1873, an organ that is still in use in 2011. The dissolution of the society in 1898 also ended the separatist religious practices. There were personalities there. We were joined by Paul Goebel portraying a reporter from the New York Herald and his wife Gainel and David Walker and his wife Holly portraying President Jefferson Davis and his wife Verena Davis. President and Mrs. Davis are going to be interviewed by the reporter from the New York Herald. Here I have to tell you I'm a personal friend of Abraham Lincoln. In fact I was with Lincoln at Gettysburg. When we got off the train I stepped, we stepped out and of course left the train station. The Lincoln uh, diner is right across the street there. Now, when I go back to Gettysburg, many of the people ask me, did Mr. Lincoln eat in the Lincoln Diner? And I have to tell them, no, he did not. Too many booths. <laughs> <laughs> well, we want to welcome everyone today. This is a rare opportunity for me being from the New York Herald. Uh, Mr. Davis and his lovely wife, uh, Verena, have consented to be uh, interviewed by a paper of the North. And of course, my publisher, G. Gordon B uh, Bennett, uh, has commissioned me to try to get to the bottom of the real Jefferson Davis. Uh, I would like to uh, begin by saying a little bit about Jefferson Davis. Uh, he and I have a history together. Uh, he was in the Senate and in fact was a, a, a very strong uh, politician. Uh, basically many, many people, both North and South, believed that one day he would be the president of the Republic. And it is in that vein I would like to talk to both uh, Mr. Davis and also his lovely wife about some of those things. Uh, there is a connection with Mrs. Davis with Mrs. Lincoln. I believe that you shared a dressmaker, did you not? We certainly did. None other than Mrs. Keckley. Yes. She, in fact, she worked for me prior to the war. Would this not be one of her dresses? It is. Oh, very pretty, very pretty, very yeah. becoming. She made many things for my husband. Uh, there was one Christmas gift in particular where uh, uh, she didn't quite get it done on time, and we were making a silk robe for him, and uh, she was there the wee hours of the night on Christmas Eve for the sing, but she did get it done for him. Right, so, yeah. uh, what's it like being married to uh, uh, a, a legend, not only the North, but also the South? It's certainly had its challenges. Uh, Mr. Davis 
uh, is quite a bit older than myself, 18 years in fact. Uh, when we married, I was 18, and of course that made him 36. And uh, with him being a politician, uh, we were not married long when he campaigned for Congress and was elected, and uh, we made our way north to Washington City. And uh, that was quite a trip in itself. Uh, the trip had many hardships, but uh, once we did get up to the city, uh, it was quite an experience for me. For one thing, we were in a boarding house for a period of time, and that really didn't feel like home, but I was thrust into uh, society, and quickly I had to make new friends, learn to deal with politicians and their wives, and uh, certainly became uh, adept at throwing parties. But uh, Mr. Davis, he, he's quite an opinionated man. Um, and uh, I'm known for speaking my mind, and I sometimes have a sharp tongue, and that's gotten me into some problems with the papers and uh, with my peers and so forth. But, but, uh, so, but Mr. Davis, he, he's the kind of man that thinks he's always right. And I'll explain that. <laughs> He's a wonderful soldier, but as far as being a politician, he is, I must say, he's probably not the smoothest politician that uh, that has been out there. Well, well, let's talk a little bit about your political career. I mean, you being a senator from Mississippi, you being a, one of a, a war hero there from the Mexican War, and like, including the, uh, the Black Hawk War. I believe Mr. Lincoln was even in that war and the like. Uh, so what does it feel like to be a consummate politician and now uh, playing your role down there as a, uh, uh, some might say, traitor? I don't like that word, traitor. Because you're only a traitor if your side loses. If you're, you win, you're not a traitor. For instance, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Samuel Adams. They were all traitors, weren't they? They were traitors to the crown, declaring their independence. But they won. So now they go from traitor to patriot. We want to be patriots. Why'd we leave the Union? There's many, many reasons. But the thing of it is, when you have a strong, meddling federal government that tries to stick their nose in your business, it upset a lot of Southerners. Now, I could go on and on and on, but I'm not going to. Because I was already told, be short and sweet, like the old woman's dance, I think, by my wife this morning. <laughs> your words kind of strike me uh, and bring to mind that knowing you when you were in the Senate, that you were quite a fer fervent nationalist. You know, you honestly believed that not that the both the North and the South could conquer this continent and the like. Uh, obviously, in the early parts of, of the uh, the current untroubledness or the troubledness, uh, you you basically never joined with the fire eaters. Oh, was it? And, and of course, even President even Lincoln. Uh, in 1858, when he was with his uh, Lincoln Douglas debate in Alton, Illinois, even mentioned that you were an able and eloquent statesman. A and many people, as I said earlier, felt that you would become president one day. And, and you know, we kind of wonder what happened. You mean what, what caused all the change? Yes, because I do feel that, that you did change, <coughs> at, at least the perception. I did. Okay. I did. I did. How old are you? <laughs> How old are you? Six or seven? Nine. Nine. You know what it means to leave family? The word secession means withdrawal. And I was totally against secession. But you got to remember, I represented Mississippi. And what's a representative supposed to do? Represent. Correct? In fact, when I took a tour of New England, because I wanted to go to Boston to see where this 
sign of the Boston Massacre was. And see those sites. And I gave a tour, had a, a speaking engagements. In fact, we spent time in Auburn, New York with uh, William Seward. And of course, you know William Seward. Absolutely, just, yes. It was Lincoln's Secretary of State. But once my state withdrew from the Union, you no longer represent that state in that body called the Senate. Because I served in both the House of Representatives, I served in the Senate, I was Secretary of War under Franklin Pierce for four years, I fought in the Mexican-American War, would that make me a very strong quote unquote America. And we you don't think, think it that. hurt when I saw, when I had to say we got a fire on Fort Sumter, which basically started the war. But once I was elected president, I took that job very seriously, compared myself to my hero, George Washington. We all, you know, Lincoln even says he loves George Washington. You know, I read that book by Parson Weems and I didn't, never did believe that uh, he chopped down the cherry tree or so forth. But once I became president, we were fighting for independence, and that's what changed. How was that? Very good, very good. Well, just what, good. What, what, why don't why don't we move on to the uh, current situation? Uh, what is your feelings, and what is the feelings of your general staff about the Union Army? What, where, where do you where do you see? Uh, people like uh, McClellan and uh, me. Oh, he was a, McClellan was a great general, stupid. <laughs> when he would do reconnaissance around, we would send our cavalry around. Now think of it this way. We would send about 12,000 troops around. He'd say, oh, they have 12,000 troops. We'd send them around again say once, and he'd say, well, they have 24,000. <laughs> we send them around again, all of a sudden it magnified to 36,000. We send them around again, all of a sudden it's 48,000. He wouldn't fight. He did not. He was one of the best generals for training men to fight, but he didn't want to take a minute to fight. Now we have Meade. Oh, Meade. Meade was very reserved, but... Uh, I think Meade was misunderstood. You know, he stayed the uh, commander of the Army of Virginia, but when uh, the, the Union, or Lincoln had an overall commander named Grant, he was over Meade. He was not, he just followed the Army of Northern Virginia. And what happened is, uh, Grant says, we're gonna bag Lee's army. You know what that means? We're going to bag Lee's army. We're not going to go to Richmond like all the other generals. And that's why probably with the, the uh, when Robert E. Lee became commander of the Army of Virginia, everything changed. And people said, well, how can you? George Thomas was loyal to Virginia. I mean, loyal to the Union. Robert E. Lee was loyal to Virginia. All these men had different reasons for fighting for the Southern cause. If you lived in Alabama, guess who you was going to fight for? Alabama. Alabama. You know, all these men had different reasons for fighting, but overall, my generals were very successful. One of my, one of my better friends, Albert Sidney Johnson, died in Shiloh too early in the war, April of 62. I don't know if you know this, he was my number two general. Mm. So Can I answer the question? Well, I, I, want, I, I want you to expand upon that. You know, you, you, you were very <laughs> candid with all of us, uh, speaking about the Union uh, generals and the like. Uh, how did you really feel? Uh, you with your military background, and now all of a sudden you're like the leader of it, but now you have to depend upon them to follow those orders and think, how do you feel about how well do you think they followed your orders and things that were given? Uh, that there seems to be quite a bit. Uh, your claims of states' rights and things, and now all of a sudden you were taking these militias from the south and bringing them together on the type. Of, did you ever have any problems with some of the governors over that? <laughs> do I have an hour? Uh, 
I'm going to start patient. with my five generals. Number one, Samuel Cooper, adjutant general. Number two, Albert Sidney Johnson. Number three, Robert E. Lee. Number four, Joe Johnston, who thought he should be number one. <laughs> and then P.T. Beauregard, number five. You have these men that think they're more important than they are. You ever been around people like that? <laughs> they think they're more important than they are. I'll mention another one, Braxton Bragg. Great, great strategist, eventually becomes my military advisor. Uh, the officers hated him. Because most of the time he didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> The enlisted men like him. That's that's the difference. But the second part of that question was what? How do you feel you being a military man yourself? Uh, how do you feel that they are able to take you know you being the commander in chief? Well, of I that went life? to Manassas and I saw Southern troops running. I said, "Stop! Stop! Stop!" Now, did I change anything? No, I did not. But P.T. Beauregard and Joe Johnson, as soon as I'm on the field, who do they assume is in the command? Me. You don't want to be in command. You don't want to take your commander in chief out there and get killed in a battle. So, even at that battle of Manassas, people said to me, I was criticized by the newspapers for not sending those Confederate troops into Washington City and taking the capital. But you know what? My men didn't have ammunition, they didn't have water, they didn't have food, and basically they weren't very well trained. In fact, two armies met at Manassas. The Yankees called Bull Run after the river. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, it took place July 21st of uh, 1861, even people from Washington City about the watch got in the way of their troops running. You can't, it's very difficult to take two half-trained civilian mobs and send them into battle. That's just the way it was. And both armies had to regroup and Lincoln's desire of 90 days, <laughs> he thought he was going to defeat the, the Confederacy in 90 days. Did it happen? No. The armies regrouped under command of George McClellan, and nothing basically happened. And we did the same thing. We wanted our strength to be brought up. Now today, rumor has it that uh, another one of your generals are, uh, uh, have come here, uh, a fellow by the name of Thomas Jonathan uh, Jackson. Jackson. I was at, when you say about Manassas, and I was there interviewing uh, Bernard Bee. And I saw him look up the hill there and say, there stands Jackson like a stone wall. And of course, that nickname certainly has stuck. How do you feel about uh, Stonewall Jackson today? Uh, we in the North know him as being rather a hypochondriac, or riding into battle with an arm up to, to uh, balance his humors in his body, but how do you feel about being a military man and how, has, how successful has he been in your eyes? He was very, very successful. His men loved him. And the thing it is, he had that ability to take men and work them together. You're on 1030, are you in here? They said the tent. The tent. Okay. We prefer to play outside where it's cooler. Go play outside then. I think they're having a worship uh, service. Uh, okay. <laughs> right. we'll that well, let's get back to the. What was the question? Well, Mr. Jackson, how do oh, you feel yeah, about Oh, yeah, well, I, I, I evaluate him very highly, and his death was accidental. And uh, Robert E. Lee said he lost his right arm. He was an odd man to talk to, very quiet, but uh, and very religious. Jackson? Yes, and uh, so Brian and I, you know, we are members of the Episcopalian Church in uh, Richmond and uh, love to praise the Lord. But he was just a little odd, but all I can say is you like results. Exactly what are, what 
does the South want out of this uh, situation? Well, when you say independence, what does that mean? At independence least from means point. we are a separate country modeled after the United States. You know, our Constitution wasn't too different, but the problem with our Confederacy is this. The state's rights made us lose the war. They wanted to be 11 individual states. In fact, Governor Brown, uh, my goodness, he wanted to take withdraw his troops. How many don't know the difference between the regular army and militia? Yeah, I bet, young lady, you can explain it to everybody, could you? No. How many say militia is kind of like a part-time army? The regular army, in fact, we initiated the draft. You know who wrote up the draft? It's George Randolph. How many say, who in the heck's George Randolph? He's the 13th child of Martha Jefferson Randolph. His grandfather was Thomas Jefferson. He was in the cabinet. I didn't get along with him. In fact, I'm thinking I didn't get along with most of them. Brina used to tell me, go ahead, Brina, tell him what you said to me. <laughs> Here again, he he was very opinionated. And uh, uh, I always told him, Jefferson, I said, sometimes you have to concede some of those opinions to, to be a better politician, but uh, he always had to be right. Well, let me, let me explain myself. <laughs> I sit for hours thinking through all this. And then I would explain it, and, and my and my opinion would be, this is the only right way to do it. And when we met, she wrote a letter to her mother that says, every time he states an opinion, he just agree, thinks that everybody agrees with him. And a lot of times, I don't. And let me tell you, behind closed doors. You ladies know what I'm talking about, don't you? A lot of times behind closed doors, she let me know her true feelings. Now, did I resent that? Did I go away pouting and crying a bucket of tears? <laughs> no. I'd listen to my wife. Gentlemen, listen to your wives. She was, she had so many um, receptions, even for, uh, President Taylor, who happened to be a Whig, and, and, and she had Whig affiliation, and I was a Democrat. And uh, that little brooch, you still have that, that you always had that Whig brooch that, that I would see. I still have that put away. Yeah. But anyway, she was good with taking different people with different philosophies, getting them to work together. I'm telling you one thing right now. I have to admit, there's times I look back, I did. I thought, if you don't think my way, that's why I had so many Secretary of War, including Randolph. He said, why don't you allow me to do my job? And I said, well, I did it. For President Pierce, I think I'm better than any of you. That isn't a good way to make somebody do a better job is tell them you're better at it than they are. Does anyone have any questions you'd like to pose to either Mr. or Mrs. Davis? No, there's no such thing as a stupid question. <laughs> Only an unasked one. I know you're thinking. I'm thinking, thinking, thinking. He was involved with that Gadsden purchase down there in, in Texas. You being pretentious. You mean near Arizona. Like, huh? Arizona. Well, right, but I'm just saying the Gadsden purchase right. there on that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. What well, were you trying we to do up that, there? We need that slip that we needed that sliver of land to get the, the railroad through. Transcontinental Railroad, yes. Mm -hmm. So I was for that. And then Brina, I don't know, did you mention the fact that I worked uh, the, a lot of the Capitol building and all the things I did around Washington City as a senator or secretary of war before? The Smithsonian I, Institution? Yes. Of course, and, and, and the, re, and, and the and Capitol and, Dome. A lot of people right. don't know that my husband is responsible for remodeling of the Capitol and that beautiful dome that we see. We didn't get to see it finished. That's the hardest thing for us As to we do. left Washington City, the dome was only half done, and it was just seemed like a foreboding of what was to come. It just looked so eerie there, half of the dome. And us leaving knowing that the work wasn't done and 
new work had to be started. It was just a terrible feeling. You know, it's really sad that when we left Washington in January 61, after spending uh, a lot of years there, almost 15 years there on and off, we never stepped foot in Washington City again. Ever. How are you folks? Uh, we're interviewing uh, President Jefferson Davis and his lovely wife, Marina. Do you have any uh, questions you might want to pose to the President of the Confederacy? Besides, who are they? <laughs> Oh, I think everyone knows who you are. Uh, you certainly have enough coverage, not only prior to, but also after your ascension. So do you have anything you'd like to uh, pose to them? Why would the southern states have the audacity to think they had the right to break away from the Union? Where does it say in the Constitution they can? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. Right. Where does it say in the Constitution they can? That, that does give them the, each individual state the right to, to become its own nation. Well, I started to answer one question and I got sidetracked. The downfall of the Confederacy was this. There were 15 originally slave states. Only 11 ended up fighting for the Confederacy. Four did not. When you take 8 to 10 to 12 pencils and put them together, you can't break them. But a lot of those individual states, like uh, Brown, and uh, they would say, hey, we're going to withdraw the militia from the regular army. We're going to bring back the regular, the, our militia to protect our state. The, the, the armies couldn't survive. And militia's part-time army, if they wanted to leave, they could leave. I mean, didn't know that. Without being like born. a volunteer fire department, you know, you're on on duty all the time. So that's in a sense what defeated us. And plus, maybe a lot of you don't know, at the beginning of 1860, the North had 22 million people. We had 11 million. Out of that 11 million, we had 4 million enslaved people. That leaves how many? <laughs> See, even my children, when I ask the children that, they're, something about mathematics just doesn't work the way it used to. In other words, four million, seven million, five. And with the help of Robert E. Lee, who is probably one of the greatest generals, you know, when he graduated from West Point, he was second in his class. And the smartest, and they graduate because you got the merits and your grades. He graduated number two, and you're placed in the, the, the old major is, um, my mind went blank, engineering. He's an engineer. Next down is artillery. Next down is cavalry. Next down is infantry. Now, you know where I got placed when I was graduated from the point at the age of 20? Infantry. So, infantry is the one that goes out and fights the battles. Artillery fires cannons. Cavalry, cavalry goes and tries to do raids, and they're the eyes of the army. Engineers, who you think, builds the forts. And so forth. And uh, that's what tore us apart. Lack of in other words, when we stopped having prisoner exchanges, we never had any new men to replenish our army. Grant had plenty. Plus, with the Emancipation Proclamation, the blacks could join the Union Army. They couldn't before. It's interesting when you talk about Lee, and of course, they're uh, early in the war when they used to refer to him as an old granny. And of course, you know, when they kept talking about you know him digging all those trenches and the like, uh, and of course, what wound up happening when he finally took command, uh, and he became basically a one-man army. And uh, you know, how did that sit with you? There's only two people who could change my mind about anyone, anything. Militarily, it was Robert E. Lee. So on the domestic front. Why, uh, why didn't the uh, South?
out. Look at the prolonged, look at the war as possibly prolonged and understand that they're gonna need industry that supplied them from the north down south before they fired on Fort Sumter. Well, that's a very good question. I'm elected president, okay? Based on my military career and also being a House of Representatives in the Senate and the being Secretary of War. Industry was shunned. I remember even saying to my brother one time, why don't we mill our own cotton? He looked at me like, why are you trying to change your homeland? This is the way we live. They didn't want to change, and you got to realize that our economy was based on the slave slavery, and it was dying out. If my hope was that it would eventually die out, and there's so many people that say, "Well, slavery was such a cause." Well, maybe it was part of the causes, but it's not why the Southern soldiers fought. You're not going to spend, none of you would raise your hand and say, I would spend four years in a wool uniform in the heat and the cold, hardly getting fed, hardly getting paid, marching 20 miles with improper gear, lack of water, lack of food, so you could, your rich neighbor could own a slave. Would you? No. But that's what they try to say. That's being too simplistic. So industry, it's like when Washington became president, he didn't have the war to deal with right away. I became president right away by April. I was inaugurated February 18th, 61, March, April. Within two months, we had a war for us. And my poor wife, we get settled in Montgomery. We were no longer in there and then they announced that we had to move our home up to Richmond because of the Confederate and Confederate for the White House up there. But uh, we did not like Richmond. Fire eaters, abolitionists. We were from the old plantation class. Richmond was old money and they knew the difference. And I, I was shunned by many of the social circles down there. Up in Washington City, I was at the pinnacle, I was the one throwing the parties. Very well liked, friends of many politicians' wives. Especially my former father-in-law. Before he died in 1850, you knew he was, don't you? Zachary Taylor. Uh, the ladies of Richmond, I had a few friends up there, but um, my social circles were small and I kept myself very guarded. I'm sorry, speak up, please. Mary Chestnut was indeed a good friend of mine. This gentleman brought up an interesting point talking about the industry and things like that. Most people in the North would consider your economy based not only on slaves, but also on cotton. And, and uh, we question what happened to you prior to the outbreak of war with the cotton thing, you know, all of a sudden withholding it. What were you trying to accomplish by withholding cotton? Well, we didn't withhold it. Lincoln illegally had a blockade. Blockaded the South. And the thing with it is, why was it an issue? We thought that France and uh, Great Britain could not survive without our cotton. They did. India. They got their cotton from India. And then they would not join Confederacy because uh, the issue of slavery. You know, England did away with slavery in 1831. Yeah. Way before we did. Yeah, way before. Except, except in the Caribbean because of the sugar trade. Yes. To be fair. Okay, well, the thing of it is, there was so much antagonism, whereas northern people really didn't understand southern people. You know, out of 10, maybe two out of 10 people owned slaves. And a number of people even today say, well, every 
everybody owned a slave, are you kidding me? Not when you go to a slave auction in 1850 and pay $1,200 to start a bid on a carpenter being $1,200. You could buy a house for $1,200. And then, according to Uncle Tom's cabin, Harry Beecher Stowe assumes that everyone beats their slave. Well, I'm not going to buy a new piece of machinery and take a sledgehammer to it right away because it didn't, didn't work for me one day, would I? <laughs> yes, there were some cruel people. I called them white trash because they, they did not value any human being, black or white. They abused their wives, they abused their children, hated them. But then you get all lumped together. You know, just like blondes or, or <laughs> dizzy or redheads have a temper. Oh, you are? <laughs> oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, that uh, people want to look at what well, they did this. I always ask people, who's they? They always say, well, they did this. They did that. Anything yeah. else, sir? Yes, ma'am. Did you have trouble getting the southern farmers to grow food for the for your new country. Well, I'll tell you what, where you think the breadbasket of the Confederacy was. Yeah, that's, see, that's another thing. The things they grew, they, you couldn't eat. You ever stop to think of that? Can you eat tobacco? Of course I had people tell me you could. You know, I, I tasted it. I bet it tasted pretty good. You can chew it, but you can't eat it. And you can't eat cotton. Those were two staples of the South. The Shenandoah Valley, why do you think we had so many, many battles there? Take it away. We do have that presentation. Which does bring us to the battle today, which will be General Jackson uh, here in the Shenandoah Valley. We certainly thank all of you for coming this, after, this morning and we hope that you'll stay around. We will be on the grounds today, so if you have questions for any of us, I'm certainly sure that Mr. Davis would be more than happy to uh, answer any question you have and to debate if you'd like. And of course, Mrs. Davis, Verena will be there too, a very lovely lady that would be more than happy to, uh, to tell her, to tell you about her life living with Mr. Davis. She's and of course, I'll be there. Well, <laughs> I, have, I have since met Mrs. Davis, and uh, I have uh, raised my expectations of her. Thank you so much. Well, she was educated by George Winchester uh -huh. from uh, Pennsylvania. But she does not carry his rifle, I hope. No. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. Unfortunately, I'm not able to show the part where Verena spoke about their children. A truck pulled up outside and sounded like a vacuum cleaner. President and Mrs. Jefferson had six children. Three died before reaching adulthood. She told it much better than I could. The reenactment was also joined by the Camp Chase Fife and Drum Corps band. Camp Chase Fife and Drum has been a leader in historical military field music since 1983. Camp Chase is an authentic recreation of a Civil War period regimental fife and drum corps named after the combined Union Army training camp and Confederate prisoner of war camp that was located near Columbus, Ohio during the Civil War. Their music, played on authentic wooden fifes and rope tension drums, comes from the military field music manuals used by the armies of the United States and Europe from the mid-18th century to the late 19th century.
artillery was getting ready for a demonstration. Their camp was near the battlefield. They had civilian and soldier reenactors. which is a blanket organization across the entire west of the Civil War reenactors. For us, west is west of the Appalachians. So I'm in charge of all the federal artillery out there. One of the units I am with, my home unit here, is the 1st Ohio Battery A. We are based here in Ohio, out of Columbus. We have members from Ampham, Cleveland. We got members from Zanesville, all over the state of Ohio. We got some guys from out by Dayton. Um, we're always looking for more recruits, so if anybody's interested in coming out and firing a cannon, come see us after we get done with the demonstration, and we'll talk to you some about what's going on, and maybe in a future event we can get you in. So, what we have here is a six-pounder, and uh, Jordan, go ahead and wake the neighbors. Good number one, solid shot, blue! This is one of our smaller weapons that we have in our in our uh, active private guns group. Um, we also have a couple of a couple of 12 pound sized weapons that are a little bit larger, a little bit heavier. It's called a six pounder because that's the size of the ammunition. We fired a solid six pound ball during the war, so that's how that's how you get the six pound size. Okay, all the kids down up Ready. over in that area and all the kids over in this area. I Ready. want you to cover your ears with your hands and open your mouths. what they would have been in full size during the war. <laughs> Once they secure the piece here, we're going to run through what each person on there does. Uh, one piece of information that we can go over right now for this weapon, we had three different types of ammunition that we would use during the Civil War. One of them, as I said before, was a solid shot. It was a six pound for this gun, solid shot, just a round ball, about half the size of a full size shot put that you have nowadays. Also, similar to that, we had the exact same thing, except it was a cast. It was, it was cast with a with a big cavern in the middle of it. They would fill that up with gunpowder. Everybody knows in the Star Spangled Banner, the bombs bursting in air. That's that one. It's a spherical case. The idea would be for us, we would try and shoot it, get about 30 feet over the top of the enemy infantry, and have it explode over the top of the enemy infantry and rain the shrapnel down from above and kill as many of the infantry as possible with it coming down from above. As the, as the infantry continued to get closer to us, um, into about a quarter of a mile, maybe about an eighth of a mile, we would switch over to what's called canister. Think of a coffee can, a old steel coffee can. Now put some sawdust in there and fill it up with 45 caliber balls, about half inch diameter balls. Now we're gonna steal balls, we're gonna shove that in here, we're gonna make this into a giant shotgun and those, when it goes off, those steel balls separate, go all over the place, and just create havoc throughout the enemy infantry lines. They're big and heavy enough that they'll go through the guy in the front and into the guy in the back and kill both of them. Or take, in any ways, take them out in some manner. So, starting with what everybody does on the gun. Number one, that's what's called a ram sponge. Every, after every round, he'll go in there with the sponge end and kind of clean out everything, make sure all the embers are dead. During the war, they would have done this about once every five rounds. The reason they did it, they would go in there to pull out the black powder fouling so that the gun didn't get all full of the black powder residue after it gets done firing. We have to do it every time 
because we're a little bit more concerned with safety, some of their safety practices they didn't worry about when you have bullets flying at you. So it's kind of a balance of which one's safer. The other end has the ram. He uses that to ram the charge and the ball into the, into the bent reach of the gun so that the gun can be fired. Number two has what's called a worm. We use that to go in there and pull out our aluminum foil packet. During that, we put the gunpowder in an aluminum foil packet to, to introduce our charges into the gun. During the war, they used a linen packet. It burned up completely. They didn't have to go in there and get it out. Instead, during the war, they used that piece of equipment for if they had a misfire. And they had to go in there and pull the ball out with, the, with a charge in there behind it that may or may not go off. They're not really sure, they're, but they're pretty sure it's probably not going to go off. So they go in there with that grab the ground out of there and pull it out. Uh, we are looking for some volunteers to help out with that demonstration. Anybody want to help us with that one? Never, never get any volunteers. I also, also, anybody volunteer for playing ball catcher? <laughs> so, number three. He's got, in his right hand, he's got what's called the prick, and in the left hand, he's got a thumb stall. The prick is used for exactly that. He puts it in the, after they've introduced the charge, he pricks, put, puts it in the vent and pricks a hole in the top of the charge so that when we introduce the fire to the top of the vent, it'll actually go off. His thumb stall is used to cut off oxygen from going into the gun after it's been fired while we're cleaning it out. If the idea is to try and keep as little oxygen in there, help smother down the, any kind of embers or anything like that that are still in there, make them all go away. Number four, that's a lanyard. On the, on the end of the lanyard is a primer. You pull the lanyard, it sets off the primer by, it's got a little friction uh, start on, kind of like a match up on the top, and that leads into a, a little gunpowder section that's kind of like a 22 bullet. There's enough, enough powder in there to fire a 22 bullet. It fires that charge down into the lower charge, and using the flame from the upper charge, it sets off the lower charge, firing the whole piece. Now as we go back, there's a number five. He's got what's called a gunner haversack. He's going to go from the back of the, of the limber there up to the front of the piece to carry the ammunition from the back to the front. Also back on the back of the, of the limber, which is our ammunition chest back there, there's a number six, seven, and eight. Five and seven would alternate who was going up front with their gunner haversacks so they didn't have to run quite so much. Six and eight would go in there and cut fuses to length so that we had the explosive round, they would make sure that the explosive round blows up where we want it to blow up. They also would pull out whatever kind of round the gunner would, would call out. So which brings us to the gunner. Right smack dab in the middle of everything. He's the, one that's per he's the person in charge of the piece. He count hollers out all the commands. He has there what's called a pendulum hoss. That's used for sighting it. It's kind of it's got some adjustment capabilities so that if you're on a hill and you're leaning to the side, it can help you with that a little bit. It also, um, in the limber, they tell you if you want to fire the gun so many yards down field, what degree angle you need to have the gun at, and then that hoss allows you to put that gun at the right level so that it'll go out and come down where you want it to come out at. So at this point, we're going to run through the, through the drill slow and I'll explain what everybody's doing as they're doing it. Number one, load. So by detail. Jordan, by detail. By detail. So the first person's going to go in there. Their number three's going to go in. And number one, or num number one, two, and three are all going to go in. Wayne. Just see. Oh, okay. Okay, you're getting out of the way. So the guy, number two worm, now number one's going to go in sponge, while number three is back there blocking off the air from going into the unit. Number one now puts the ram up on the, up on the gun so that he can tell the gunner that the gun is ready for the charge to be brought up. Number five comes up, shows the gunner what he's got in his pouch so the gunner can confirm he's got the right round. Takes it up to number two. Number two takes the charge out, introduces it to the front of the gun. Now during the war, that would have actually had the ball attached to it while they're putting that in there. Two steps out of the way, number one now rams the charge to the breech. 
Everybody steps out. Number three goes to the back of the trail to help aim it while the gunner pulls out that pendulum hoss and aims the gun. Everything looks good for where he is aiming where he wants it to go. Everybody goes back to the original positions, which brings up the second verbal command that the gunner says. Ready. Numbers two, numbers three and four now step in at the back of the gun. Three pricks a hole in the back of the charge. Four put, introduce the primer. They stretch out the lanyard. And kids, open your mouths and cover your ears. Because he's going to say the third command now. One, five. Now we're going to go up and have them fire this piece at full speed with a. Uh, just going and loading it up full, full go. Okay, kids, cover your ears and open your mouths. One, five. Does anybody have any questions while they close up the gun here? Why do we have to open our mouths? So the concussion that comes off of that gun causes a pressure differential, and it's less important for the adults, but for small kids, it actually, it actually has the capability of rupturing the eardrum uh, when it's not completely developed um, with smaller kids it's actually a uh, it's it's more fragile than with uh, with older kids and adults after the artillery demonstration everyone started getting ready for the reenactment of the first battle of Kernstown the first battle of Kernstown was fought on March 23rd 1862 in Frederick County and Winchester, Virginia. It was the opening battle of Confederate Major General Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson's campaign through the Shenandoah Valley during the Civil War. Attempting to tie down the Union forces in the valley under the overall command of Major General Nathaniel P. Banks, Jackson received incorrect intelligence that a small detachment under Colonel Nathan Kimball was vulnerable but it was in fact a full infantry division, more than twice the size of Jackson's force. His initial cavalry attack was forced back and he immediately reinforced it with a small infantry brigade. With his other two brigades, Jackson sought to envelope the Union right by way of Sandy Ridge, but Colonel Erastus B. Tyler's brigade countered his movement and when Kimball's brigade moved to his assistance, the Confederates were driven from the field. There was no effective Union pursuit. Although the battle was a Confederate tactical defeat, it represented a strategic victory for the South by preventing the Union from transferring forces from the Shenandoah Valley to reinforce the Peninsula campaign against the Confederate capital, Richmond. 
First Battle of Turnstown may be considered the second among Jackson's rare defeats. Soldiers are there to stop us.
tell you about their hobby, what they like, the history of it, but sometimes who they portray, sometimes an ancestor, sometimes... Here are some of the setups around the Union camp. This is how many of the reenactors cook while they are out. This man was grabbing a quick cup of coffee after the battle. These women were taking a breather in between lunch and dinner. Much of the town of Zor remains unchanged since the days of the separatists. The tin shop still stands. It was built in 1825 and reconstructed in 1970. This is the museum. It is quite a beautiful building. This is the Confederate camp. These men had just returned from battle and were nursing their wounds. The commanders were commending them on their bravery and heroism. During the time of the separatists as today, Zor had a large garden. Back then they would have grown food, while today they grow mostly flowers and a few herbs. This is the gardener's house and greenhouse. The greenhouse would have been used to start seeds in the spring and also to grow citrus. Zor was one of the only communities in the north to have citrus. The bakery is really kind of a neat place. They have baked goods, jams, cookbooks, and old time sodas. You can see where they used to make the baked goods. The interpreter was very busy with customers in the other room, so I'm not completely sure what they are drying. We thought it might be hops, but didn't know what the application for baking may be. Overall, the experience at Zor 2021 was a resounding success. I'm really looking forward to Zor 2023. If you've never been, you should definitely check it out. Please like, subscribe, and click that bell.